Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp. We're here to talk about all sorts of things that are happening in the world today, including a lot of things to do with your city council. Uh, city council is looking to update the major Higgins corridor by basically smooshing all the lanes together to make single lanes and make safer left turn lanes for uh, the throughout the uh, Higgins corridor from basically Brooks all the way to Main Street. So a good chunk of that will be updated sometime and I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the show. Uh, we have a new episode of uh, uh, dubbing stuff, I guess. Um, but yeah, so we have all that and more. Let's just dive right in. So Missoula is looking to turn our one-way street into two ways. Front and Main are looking to get a new paint job and updates reflecting a growing city that needs to update our transportation infrastructure. The city now plans to apply for funding from the new federal RAISE grant and build a uh, delegation of supporters to enhance its odds of success. The city is eligible to receive around $1 million according to uh, Deborah Posma, an associate planner with the Missoula Metropolitan Organization. The total costs uh, are ranging about about $4.5 million for this project. In addition, Missoula plans to update the Higgins Corridor to improve the roads and effectively turn the downtown area into a single lanes with a turning lane in the center and plenty of room for bike lanes. Uh, for your information, the city is also looking to do something like this for some time now, but are looking to get federal funding and money from uh, Montana Department of Transportation to help pitch in. In my opinion, it does feel like a bit much for changing signage, but parking is something that will have to change, especially on Main Street, since they do have slanted parking. Another major Missoula Current article following a uh, Brook Street study has a bus designated lane, so upwards of a, a hundred and $850,000 have been spent in federal mo uh, grants, mind you, to come up with a realistic proof of concept for Brooks, including a center running bus lane that would enable Mountain Line to launch a 15 minute service uh, along its corridor. It also w includes facilities for pedestrians and cyclists, crosswalks and renewed intersection. This is a part of the uh, Midtown Master Plan and not just for transportation, but the overall aesthetic of the whole Midtown area from Rose Park, basically all the way to Reserve Street. It's a whole chunk of area with the uh, uh, the center of it being Southgate Mall. There is a lot of construction projects actually in Missoula and it looks like we can expect to have road closures in the near future. We usually do it for repairs, so it's not like anything really ever changes. So, but these changes will probably happen within the next um, four or five years. The city spoke more about this on Wednesday and I'll have that for you in my city council report. Missoula changes are happening a lot faster these days, like uh, just thinking back to Russell Bridge, which was a fantasy for, I, I want to say about 20 years, because they were just like, we got to fix that like rickety bridge for quite some time. 2013 is when they're just like, okay, we should probably try to do something. And then they really got the ball running um, just in time for the pandemic to kind of hit. Uh, and you know, it's just a lot of things happening and you know, uh, Higgins looks like uh, you know the downtown the north side of the Bear Track Bridge. We're also seeing lanes going to single lane. So there's I'm kind of jumping around, but when we go back to Higgins and the Higgins Corridor, Bear Track Bridge, they're looking to repaint a lot of those areas to make it more single lanes, bike lanes, and more. Uh, uh, available turning lanes. From Books to Main Street covering a large portion of the Uptown Higgins, the city moves to improve flow and open up left turns for all hours of the day rather than closing left turns on peak hours. Um, I'll have more about this in my uh, city council report because I go really deep dive into this with quotes through Aaron Wilson who is a big proponent on having a lot of these roads turn into single lanes. So Montana legislature is still ongoing. Senate Bill 154 moves uh, forward uh, as the right in true privacy in terms of abortion uh, are in question. Bill would interpret say that the right to individual privacy is essential to the well-being of free society and shall not be infringed without showing of compelling state interest. If adopted, the bill would contradict a 1999 Montana Supreme Court ruling in Armstrong versus the state, which found access to pre-viability abortion from a chosen provider to be uh, appropriate exercise of medical privacy and uh, Pre-creative autonomy uh, guaranteed by the state constitution. Privacy is a big deal in Montana in many ways. What happens behind closed doors for individuals is none of your business. Although the line is drawn between the GOP and Dems of the state, but they are able to find common ground on the idea of privacy. And this law would uh, supersede a lot of those kind of privacies. So a lot, uh, uh, many Republicans and a lot, of, most of the Dems, all the Dems are all uh, against this particular bill. Senate Bill 121 passed 
second reading on party lines and it would drop the income tax rate from 6.5% to 5.9% uh, increase the earned income tax credit. Um, the Montana Democrats said this would be a tax break for the rich and the GOP, Daniel Janelko, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, from her billings, said someone earning 34000 a year would pay $1,600 in taxes, but if this bill were to go into effect, the, the single earner would pay upwards of $940 with this tax credit. And he says, tell me how this does not benefit low-income individuals. Um, we are doing that. Um, and then also in some bigger, wider news is that there's a lot of uh, things happening around and Israel uh, military forces have uh, stormed buildings resulting in many uh, um, Palestinian deaths. And so there's a lot of uh, tension going on between them and um, they've been quoting things like, oh, the, you know, uh, Thursday night's, uh, Thursday's raid of the Flashpoint Janine refugee camp descended into a gun battle that killed at least nine Palestinians while clashes everywhere left uh, a tenth dead. Gaza militants then fired rockets and Israel carried out airstrikes overnight. The exchange was limited following a familiar pattern that allows both sides to respond without leading to major flare-ups. So the escalation poses challenges for the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, ahead of his trip to the region on Sunday. So there's a lot going on here as well. And there's, um, yeah, it's, it's always a lot of back and forth. And, you know, they, a lot of times Israel is referred to as the occupying force in uh, the um, Middle Eastern uh, Israeli area as well. So there's, there's definitely a lot going on. Um, I th uh, let's see. Um, I'm just kind of scrolling over through the uh, 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 AP News wire as well as we look for further and further. Um, one of the big news items as well is that the city of Memphis uh, and the na uh, nation on Friday braced for the release of police video depicting five officers viciously beating Tyree Nichols, a black man whose death prom uh, prompted murder charges uh, against them and outrage as the country's latest instance of police brutality. So there's, a, there's definitely a lot going on there as well. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into it uh, as we uh, transition into other uh, lighter segments in more local segments here in the city of Missoula. So up next we have highlights from our Saturday drop-ins and our uh, tease for our spring flicks uh, for uh, March uh, 2023. One month and 22 days later after the girl had been held captive by the three kidnappers. There was a giant storm and the roof blew off the place where the kidnappers held the girl captive. The girl and her, her horse escaped and went to, into town to tell the police everything. She leads the police to the kidnappers. The end.
Hello humans, are you looking for a creative outlet for your children? Kids get to let their imaginations run wild in stop animation, live action, or blend them together. All sorts of wonderful things. Sign up online or call for more information. For five days in the middle of spring break, we will have a camp at MCAT. You're not doing anything, you're just pretending to do stuff. Welcome to the world of employment. All right. Hey, guys, welcome back. Let's jump right into some pre-critic where I pre-judge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my pre-biases and my avid uh, cinephile that I am. Moving on, we got a movie called Blood, one of those uh, kind of like throwaway horror movies that they uh, drop in January. Uh, hoping to get some kind of easy money and easy traction from those uh, uh, regular uh horror movie ghouls that like to go to uh, check out those kind of horror films. So we're going to jump right into this. Is a movie about werewolves or uh, um, vampires or whatever. But the point is, is that the kid is bitten by a wolf and he basically gets like hyper rabies or something. And, and this, the mother is like, takes him to the doctor and is like, he's just getting worse. And the doctor is like, and then so join the mother on her quest to use the essential oils to cure her kids wolf werewolfism enjoy uh, all the tropes scary trees unassuming dark basements jump scares and more in this garbage jump of a january horror film next up we have uh what a perfect film to rent or stream but ignoring the theaters richard Gere is doing a third rate romance comedy about two people who either hate each other or simply are forced to cohabitate anyways enjoy an odd couple comedy romance thing with Richard Gere being like, maybe it's not too late to love. When is Magic Mike coming out again? All right, finally, uh, this is a foreign film, uh, so it's called Close. Not sure if this was meant to be gay, but let's face it, these two young boys have it bad for each other. And when their meddling mothers block their friendship, you are left with a yearning that German films are on point for. Hey, have you seen Wings of Desire? That's, that's, that's a hardcore yearning right there. Enjoy the complicated relationship of Eastern European country boys in a society that wants nothing to do with them. Germans have been killing it since the war epic, All Quiet on the Western Front. No pressure for close. All right, so that pretty much does it for your pre-critic. Up next, we have a, uh, a German um, silent film that I uh, added some audio myself, so I didn't redub it, so, so this is probably one of uh, three films that I've actually just added audio to because uh, it just kind of works out that way. So without further ado, from the 1929 uh, German film, Asphalt. All right, where... Hold... Wait. Hold on a minute. Who are you? Huh? Okay, come on. I know you're faking it. You're clearly just closing your eyes. Okay, um, hmm. Rise and shine, Goldilocks. <clears throat> oh, come on. Hmm? You, you'd at least be a little more shocked when I'm yelling at you. What's going on? Who are you? I'm the owner of this particular house. So you better get on out of here before I call the police or whatever. Don't give me that look. Uh, I'm not into this. Uh, just, really? Are you just going to sleep right now? I'm not going to sleep on the couch. All right, fine. I'm going to I'm just going to call someone. I'm I'm doing it. I'm going to call the police. Uh, uh, come on. Don't be like that. Oh, there you are. Mhm. Mm Hello, police. This escalated quickly. Yeah, I got some kind of intruder in my house. I need her shot. Stat. Whoa! What? what? Uh... Why'd you just do that? Do you remember the Adam Sandler movies, Fifty First First Dates? Well, you have a short-term memory problem. Oh, uh, no. I'm not falling for that. Listen, for the last week, you've had tuna, cereal, pancakes, waffle for breakfast. I wouldn't eat anything from Belgium. What's wrong with Belgium? Well, let me tell you there, sister. The plane lost my luggage. Oh, and that's all of Belgium's fault? Come on now. The hotel gave up there my reservation. There was a Super Smash Bros. Tournament. I don't want to hear any of this. Get off me. I feel like I'm in a Jim Carrey movie. God, get off me. This isn't funny. No. Quit acting like a baby. I'm a grown adult. No. Get off. Ugh. Uh, um, well, I... Uh, hmm, serves you right. Go, go, yoga. You're not getting away that easily. Yeah. Uh, get off me! Ah, uh, I knew I shouldn't have made that wish on the monkey paw. Just get off me! I don't want this. I love you. 
What? No, get, I love you! You know, now that you look at me with those crazy eyes, I, uh, um, uh... Yes, given. I know you cannot resist. Please! This isn't appropriate for Friday mornings. Your next video better have beach exploitation films from the young teenage years from the 50s. And if you don't do it, I will come back. No, please. Those are terrible. You have no choice. You know, when I rewatch some of them, I always think of a couple of great zingers that I can just throw in there for no good reason. When she's ripping the phone out from the wall, I like to think, I was thinking to myself, it's like, it's clobbering time or at least um, uh, Hulk smash or something like that. That would have been great, but oh, too late. All right, we're going to jump right into uh, your favorite segment, City Council, where we're going to dive deeper and deeper to a series of approvals that are up on the City Council Consent Agenda from Karis Park River Access Project that will help ADA Americans with Disabilities Act individuals get the river access with ease. The deconstruction and brown side cleanup of the Sleepy Inn as the city prepares for sale of the West Side Corridor. Tourist homes, aka BRB fees are uh, updated and will cover folks using their private property as commercial temporary residences. Uh, those were on the ones that I've been kind of looking after and they were all fairly approved after the fact. Um, so this next one is a guy by the name of Mr. Cornerstone. I'm not sure if this is his name because he didn't, I did. I, I looked through it, I couldn't find what his name was, but he's talking about uh, how the tax breaks may uh, affect uh, Missoulians in the, wrong, uh, in the long run in terms of creating that uh, uh, affordable um, environment by you know property taxes. Um, but anyways, here's uh, Mr. Cornerstone. My taxes have gone up from two th up from 2006 at $3,700 to $6,700 in 2022. Special assessments were $17 in 2006 and only had two, two of them. Now there is eight of them at $742 a year. MRA receives 11 $11.468, $11.5 million from city taxes every year. We are handing money to rich developers and giant banks. We need to slow this down or stop it. It does me no good. Land trusts are not fair to people paying full price on property taxes. We all need to pay our, pay our fair share. Okay, so that was Mr. Cornerstone talking a little bit more about that. I think essentially what the city, I um, mean, in, in terms of planning and, you know, like you understand that, you know, the, uh, a lot of TIF funding uses tax incentives to uh, leverage development. Be like, hey, if you build us a sidewalk, so we'll give you uh, um, some money uh, to as tax breaks if you uh, include this provision in your construction. And in many ways, you can understand that the city is getting involved with these so-called private, public-private partnerships that lead to many good things in our community from basically saying that since you're building that motel or commercial apartment complex, perhaps you can double dip and put a sidewalk in for basic infrastructure rather than creating a SID for the current property owners to pay for it after the fact. So, you know, we have had a good couple of years of the CARES Act and ARPA funds with the new Build Back Better, more opportunities to tap into federal funded programs to make it easier for applying for these grants in the long run. You know, he did spoke very lengthy about the numbers and I suggest you check out for his full comment uh, when you get the chance. He kind of goes into the numbers and the details, but I think that uh, what the city uh, does in terms of a lot of these programs is they think about the long-term impact. So just because they get a tax break when they build and develop here doesn't mean that their property taxes for later down the line is uh, null and void. So if you think about it in the long term, in many ways that actually kind of uh, makes a lot of sense. So we kind of uh, leverage the TIF funding to be like, hey, you should, uh, you should uh, build here and do this kind of stuff. And then the people who own the building would pay the property taxes and further and further and so on and so forth. So it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. But um, up next, we also are talking about the uh, new JEDI program through the city of Missoula to include uh, justice, equity, uh, diversity and inclusion advisory council. And so Juanita Old Person uh, talks about uh, being on the council and what she plans to do. BIPOC lived experience needs to come from BIPOC led initiatives. And I feel like that's what this is. And it, the um, two other named individuals are um, black men and we both, all three of us, um, really feel like we can lay the groundwork for this 
advisory board, including the bylaws and what else is needed to be done, because who else knows the BIPOC than those that are BIPOC themselves? And I think that's one of the reasons why I really put in the time. We did put a lot of time into this, um, and there'll be a lot more time to be put in. And I think we are ready for that challenge, and it does take away from other things, but I think for my impact in this community, this is one of the ways I want to do it. All right, and so uh, that was uh, Juanita Oldperson, and she is a, 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 a board of trustee on the uh, MCPS board. This committee has uh, been in the work for some time now, and I've heard updates and other ways that the city has been trying to figure out how this council can fit into the greater Missoula area. Uh, city council uh, members spoke on this. Amber Sherrill, uh, city uh, council, spoke on this particular program. There is no way I can, I mean, it seems absurd to me, honestly, to try to say that I can understand what someone in either of those communities has, what their lived experience is. So um, I completely agree with you on that. And I appreciate um, Ms. Patrick's comments that this is not about shaming or blaming. It's about listening, learning, and I would add to that improving and changing. So it is. It's a very small thing. Um, we do need those voices at the table. I am very appreciative that they're they're willing to be there. Um, and if it's an advisory committee, which I think, um, you know, no offense to anyone, but looking around this table, I think that we 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 need more of those voices. All right. And so that was Amber Cheryl uh, talking. Um, uh, the city has been moving towards the idea of helping folks where they're at rather than meeting them halfway. Uh, this goes beyond the idea that good enough doesn't really do anything anymore at this point. And rather than look into this uh, council as a financial burden, perhaps this can be seen as a community investment. Moving on, uh, final consideration. Uh, them goats and sheep need a place to go in support of the FFA and the 4-H during a fixed amount of time to be allowed in Missoula's more urban areas. This uh, covers poultry, but not the same way that city permits year-round chickens and stuff, because the city permits, you can have a city in your kind of like your small backyard, um, with a maximum of, of five chickens, but this would also include for folks of uh, FFA and 4-H, but you do have to get your, uh, your area um, kind of uh, appraised. And so Stacey Anderson, uh, City Council, reflects on this particular uh, new proposal that the city is putting into. You know, I think that sometimes we, especially here in Missoula, forget how um, agriculturally centered our state is. It, depending on the data you look at, it, tourism or agriculture is the number one economic driver in Montana. And this is a really great opportunity to give more quote unquote city kids um, an opportunity to participate in these programs, which um, uh, Ms. West can speak to on a more personal basis, but just give them some really great opportunities, um, some different lived experiences, and just really, I think, are um, is a really cool thing to be able to do. Okay. Uh, City Council Heidi West is the one that proposed this ordinance to kind of help move it forward. Um, I'm kicking myself for not getting involved with 4-H and FFA, particularly because of the potential scholarship opportunities related to selling your livestock. So part of this is like, you know, I've seen some kids see receive upwards of $5,000 for their uh, bovine cow or what, what call you during the, uh, the Missoula County, Western Montana State Fair. Um, mind you, most of the stuff they, you sell through these programs are meant for college and not be used for money-making endeavors, but those scholarships are also create the goodwill and also a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of well-deserved uh, for many of these young folks get into these programs. And as I said in previous report, this will be used to greatly benefit youngsters urban locked in the city and allow for some sheep and goats and poultry. But unfortunately, they will not have room for pigs, cows, and other large grazing animals. Uh, final note, this is a, a seasonal thing, so families are not allowed to keep these animals year-round. So this is essentially going to be from uh, April to about the, the eventual sale of these livestock in the uh, uh, Western Montana Fair. So um, up next, uh, public hearings, we're talking mostly about rezoning unless, you know, things kind of like really happening, but uh, they didn't really comment too much about this, so I don't have much to say about some of the rezonings that are happening in Missoula. The city of Missoula is looking to the Montana legislature with great interest as bills that may affect you go on the floor of Helena. So Jessica Miller with the mayor's office speak on the house bills, especially the ones uh, about the house bill that prevents communities from banning 
So this is uh, what you've probably heard in the news or not in the news. It's the concept of ban on banning. So local communities have the ability to ban um, certain things in their community, but the state law is being like, okay, you, you can't do that. So this is uh, House Bill 407, and this is uh, Jessica Miller talking a little bit more about that. So here she is. I know that you have the the plastic bag resolution coming forward and the only bill that we've seen that that may address something in that realm is still in a draft form. Um, it's actually still uh, just a requested draft. We don't have the actual text available for it yet, but Ed Staffman out of Bozeman, Representative Ed, Staff, Ed Staffman out of Bozeman has a draft LC4078, which according to our lobbyist is going to be one, um, the actual short title of that bill is revised laws on preemption of local government authority. And uh, that one is expected to be one that would remove that, that state law about that prevents us from regulating things like plastic bags and containers. And so that's the only one that we've seen that may be related to the resolution that you folks have coming up in your Wednesday um, discussion. Yep. And it does seem as though that uh, a lot of the state laws are taking, uh, are basically uh, tying some of the local communities' uh, government's hands. Um, this item made the news cycle and has been met with great concern in local municipalities to govern and the state would make it harder for Missoula to enact this sort of ban on plastic single-use bags, which would uh, majority affect grocery stores, not so much the, uh, after the fact and will uh, be in the community until, uh, I'm not sure, you know. Um, and House Bill 258 was discussed by Mayor Jordan Hess, who spoke about the income tax credit. It's a one-time credit, and it's um, it's for people who's, who are uh, in their principal residence. Um, so it's not a long-term solution to our um, to any of our um, property tax issues. Um, it's not a structural issue. Um, it is, you know, there's there's obviously. Um, uh, great enthusiasm in Helena around rebating a portion of the surplus back to um, to Montanans. Um, so this um, this is um, there's a targeted um, uh, area median income threshold. So it um, it really the credit is um, directed um, at uh, people who uh, who need it most. All right. So the whole idea is that uh, you know Montana is feeling definitely a little bit money rich these days, and uh, part of it is they're looking to uh, give some more tax credits and tax breaks to a lot of uh, income folks looking to uh, put in there. And hey, uh, Montana is also dealing with an influx of people moving to the state over the last couple of years and seeing the income tax and this whole surplus going up as well. Not to mention, um, you probably are thinking about the whole uh, recreational marijuana thing um, in terms of uh, that being heavily taxed in different communities just to add part of that. So in, the, in many ways, even the city of Missoula is part, starting to see more of that tax revenue go into place for recreational buying weed as well. So we, I, I'm not sure what the numbers are off the top of my head, but I'll look into it maybe for next time. So moving on to the next meeting, we got a Committee of the Whole and Midtown Master Plan. So this is a kind of a big deal uh, because this is like a whole section of Missoula from uh, Rose Park all the way to Reserve Street. And basically at the center of it is um, Southgate Mall, like I was talking about in my news report. Tyler Bump the, with Echo Northwest, uh, he's the, one of the uh, planners and developers looking to uh, uh, w w uh, presenting on this particular matter um, in terms of uh, the, uh, the project overview. So this is the project overview and here's basically the map of the area. It's very kind of weird. It's kind of, it's like, um, I, you, you'll see. So uh, without further ado, here's Tyler Bump. This is the area that we are planning for and working with the community to plan for. Um, as Melanie mentioned, the Midtown, Missoula Midtown Association and community partners have identified the need for really a cohesive vision around what is Midtown and what do investments in infrastructure in place mean and how to think about supporting um, development and growth in, in the area that is consistent with the community's vision and things that, that folks want to see in the community. Uh, the plan will describe a vision that reflects Midtown's values, including the values of those who live, work, and use Midtown, and reinforce the unique character, culture, and economic activity of the area. Okay, and if I could uh, kind of take a point, you know, a lot of this particular area, you know, this is where the Southgate Mall is, a couple of businesses here and there, a good chunk of residentials as well. And I think one of the big parts of this um, Midtown plan is that they uh, actually had a lot of feedback from the Missoula community uh, to ask some questions. And as you can see from the map, the area in question is encompass the fairgrounds to the mall corner through Rose Park to Reserve Street, and a big chunk of the Missoula has always seen plenty of space and mixed residential use. And there's a lot of growth uh, um, 
uh, um, on this side of town that has to do with Southgate Mall. And while the downtown has seen major improvements in investment over the last 10 years, we see the population and interest in Missoula grow in tandem. So um, Tyler talks about feedback from community. Um, about a thousand people showed up to a, a community events um, throughout. They've had so many different uh, events. Um, I covered a live stream that they did uh, in, up in um, the uh, fairgrounds. They also did another one over by the YMCA in their uh, basketball court. Um, so they're talking probably a little bit more about that. And so Tyler talks about some of the feedback um, that they've heard. So one of the key challenges that we heard, community members want Midtown to feel more like a true destination with a sense of place and identity. We've heard pretty consistently that a lot of folks travel to Midtown for certain reasons. With our survey that we put out, we had a few hundred responses on our survey and Shields and Trimpers were like the biggest destinations for folks that did not live or work in Midtown, but frequented Midtown often. So one of the things that we've heard pretty clearly is that when people get there, there's not a sort of definition of place that makes them feel like they're in Midtown and the sort of disparate nature of what it feels like to, to be in Midtown. So opportunities, think about creating cohesive and complete neighborhoods and then leveraging some of the sub areas, how we're thinking about sub areas to create unique placemaking opportunities. How do we? All right. So a uh, part of that is like, you know, uh, another big chunk was it was safety. I mean, you know, all the buzzwords aside, uh, this has a long time coming and this is one of the main, many ways our local government can get input on change. Although it is change is inevitable, um, the Missoula will be able to have a seat at the table and kind of guide development. Not to mention, it's nice that the developers are talking to the folks and seeing the reflection of what they want this total area to be. Transportation infrastructure is on the top of the list for bike ped and safety crossing. Tyler Bump goes into housing and displacement based on um, just uh, the uh, the trends of construction that have been happening more frequently. And you know, just like I think one of the major things also um, that is being addressed in Missoula as well as this like when there's like a construction happening here, there's not many places people can actually go because people it's very competitive to actually find a place to stay in the city of Missoula as of now. So Tyler Bump talks a little bit more about home ownership. Some of the opportunities here are thinking about exploring home ownership support and shared community resource programs for low income households. Um, pursue low cost housing preservation. So one of the things we're really focused in on and we are just beginning, I'll just say it right now, we're, we're gonna go ahead and do a displacement risk analysis for the area too, to make sure that we know the areas of Midtown that have the most vulnerability and risk to displacement so that we're making recommendations, we're mitigating for those risks to communities and households that are the most vulnerable. And so understanding where those are and the relationship to our recommendations is going to be really important. Um, and in doing so, we need to understand what preservation of existing low cost affordable housing looks like. And that's a big. All right. So, yeah, I mean, that is definitely one of the many things they were talking about moving forward. Tyler also went into detail about housing stock and uh, retaining legacy businesses and the challenges for folks opening a business in Midtown, because to him, it is really hard to find a place to open a business in Midtown, although the shopping center where CBS seems to have some space for lease, FYI. Uh, land trusts are yet another topic he spoke on, and if I could refer to an older meeting, Missoula was able to acquire a whole city block in the Midtown area just across from um, Central High School. They're basically uh, planning on getting rid of the Sussex kind of a snake way that kind of goes just off of uh, South Street because there's a whole empty block right there they can totally take care of. And MCPS basically had that property as a surplus for uh, X amount of years and they just never knew what to kind of do with it. They maybe were going to build something, but th the road that just kind of goes cuts through it, Sussex Avenue, um, I mean, it's only a tiny strip that kind of goes through there. So they're uh, looking on to... Uh, uh, improve that particular area and this will be part of the Midtown Master Plan and potentially be a, a good area for people to uh, have a place uh, for affordable housing. And you know speaking of the city some of the questions brought up were about gentrification. Emily Brock Midtown Association phones in on this particular topic. One thing that we've been able to do and the community guides have been so good at is um, we can kind of run stuff by them and they're just a really good like litmus test for like pictures that could be triggering or uh, you know maybe 10 years ago we would show a really shiny picture of what something could look like but now that doesn't resonate the way that it used to we we need to be careful because when people see those shiny things they see gentrification and so there's just it's just a good um, kind of third-party validator and then also just their basic community organizing has been awesome in the sense that We've been trying so hard for years to get into the schools and to 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 work with the schools. And because these folks are parents, 
and they have relationships in the schools. And it's hard to get into the schools from a top down method. But when you go through the PTA, when you go through parents and you go through teachers, that's when you get that grassroots um, impact and that grassroots engagement in the schools. And it's really been I've never seen it happen before this way. And so that's been one thing that I'm really pleased with. Um, All right. So that was Emily Brock with the Midtown Association. And there's just a lot of moving parts moving forward. And, you know, presenters and staff were very happy to hear from the thousand people that came to these various meetings to talk about Midtown. Like I was even there and I saw the proof of uh, there's just so many people who are interested in taking part of how they want their city to grow. And there's not necessarily uh, images uh, related to uh, just what the uh, Midtown era is going to look like, but they just wanted to make sure they wanted to keep it kind of open for folks to kind of interpret and be like, oh, this is, there's so much potential for this particular area. Let's see what we can do with this. But overall, this won't solve many of the, uh, many of the issues, but it will solve a good chunk of the issues of uh, just making uh, Brooks Corridor a more of a destination than just a, a place for uh, motorcyclists to rev up their engines and curve through traffic. You've seen it, if, especially if you drive on Brook Street uh, uh, later at night. So uh, land use and planning. So a city and county team up when it comes to development. The purpose of this agreement as uh, originated in 1996 and is modified it before you today is to enhance the ability uh, of the city and county to plan for future development so that this uh, countywide pattern of development, land use and conservation is uh, created that reflects the environmental, economic, aesthetic and social values of the city and county residents. Yes, I basically copied and pasted from the website, but the overall theme of this is that I believe that this had a lot to do with the acquisition of the post office, which um, I'll, I'll refer to a little bit later on the show after I get through this topic. But um, the post office was an interesting uh, um, uh, training when it comes to uh, city county collaboration and determining like, okay, how can we work together? How can we collaborate and how we can do this? And so I was like, oh wait, there is a tool that's in place. So we need to improve that since it's been almost uh, 30 years since there's been a major update between city and county. And honestly, in, in the city of Missoula, I haven't seen the city and county this close since forever, basically. So it's interesting to just kind of see the uh, the way that Missoula is moving in terms of trends and moving forward. So we're going to work on over to Public Works as Aaron Wilson dives a little bit further into the Higgins Corridor. And, um, you know, he's the project manager and he talks about reducing lanes and uh, the Bear Track Bridge. And, you know, uh, we just got a brand new bridge, you know, it's four lanes and everything. And now uh, um, Aaron Wilson is proposing that we uh, uh, simplify and make it into single lanes. So this is Tyler uh, Aaron Wilson. Briefly about Bear Tracks Bridge, because there's been we've received a lot of feedback and there are a lot of questions about um, you know this project is the the bridge rehabilitation project is just wrapping up and you know why are we going to a different typical section or a different design of the bridge when we just built it and it was designed for two lanes of traffic in each direction um, and I'll just say that that project originated as a bridge rehabilitation and so we. The, the bridge was deteriorating and needed repair or replacement. Um, we landed on rehabilitation as opposed to fully replacing the bridge. Um, we hadn't done this study at the time that bridge was designed. And so it was designed to connect to the existing transportation on either side of, of the bridge. Um, but it also added capacity. So it's increasing the width of the pedestrian facilities, maintaining that same um, vehicle travel lane deck width and I'll just say that that reinvestment, because we had to rehabilitate the bridge anyways, um, and our anticipated lifespan of that is 25 to 50 years. So this bridge- All right, so that was Aaron Wilson talking a little bit more about that. You know, this is a presentation, they're talking about this, and you know, the big part of it is the Brooks to uh, Higgins corridor, and he goes into a little bit more uh, of the area in which um, from Brooks to about, um, uh, let me double check that, 6th Street. So Brooks to 6th Street, which is a, a major hub for people who are either going to the university or getting on to Brooks to get to uh, Highway 93 as they're going uh, from uh, I-90 to more of a north-south highway. So, so here is uh, what some of the proposed improvements of this particular area, especially when you're uh, turning off for Brooks, um, you wanted to, you know, some people like to keep going straight and remain in the right lane, but now when you basically turn off into lane, you'll be forced to turn right. So you'll turn left, but then there'll be a forced right turn lane and you'll probably be see a lot of people merging to the left lane uh, just as they get more acquainted with this site. So here's Aaron Wilson with that design. 
I also want to point out some unique designs around Highway 12. So Highway 12 runs from 5th and 6th to Brook Street and, and travels along Higgins between essentially 5th and 6th and Brooks. And that's where we see higher volumes and more of the through traffic on this corridor. Um, it tends to drop off um, once you get north of 5th. And so we looked at that and, and tried to come up with creative ways that we could preserve that capacity for Highway 12. So we keep a right turn lane coming from Brook Street to 6th. Um, that's part of that Highway 12 corridor. We keep two lanes, essentially, of vehicular traffic up to 6th. Then you get that right turn lane where we see a lot of the, the vehicle volumes are turning right to stay on Highway 12 or that 5th, 6th corridor. Um, and then you transition to the single lane going north. And then coming south, we do the same thing um, from 5th coming up to Brooks Street, where you have that dedicated right turn lane onto Brooks, where we see a lot of the, the vehicle volumes going onto Brooks. And then we have the straight through lane to continue on to Higgins. And a big chunk of this as well, if you're uh, uh, listening, um, the, the whole idea is that they're going to be basically having a, a, a single lane funnel out into these double lanes. So you'll know if people wanting to turn right can just merge to the right and then be forced to go on to Brooks or people want to keep going straight rather than um, having two lanes of traffic kind of like going super siding and then people like, oh, I'm on the right, I'm on the right lane, uh, better go to merge to the left. Because I see that way too often, but with the funnel lane, it's a single lane guaranteed to go into the left uh, lane and then you can always just go off into the turning right lane. So that makes it a little bit easier on that, but coming down um, Higgins from Brook Street might be a little bit more difficult as you can kind of see here. You know, you have two lanes of traffic that are coming down here and you, the cars will be coming through here. And then the people who used to, especially me, I love going on the right side of the lane. I don't like going to the middle lane because I'm always wary of oncoming traffic. And, you know, I kind of follow the idea that, you know, people in the left lane should be for passing only. So that's just my mindset. But so it's going to be a interesting, hard, uh, kind of a, a tricky situation moving forward. Uh, but Aaron uh, talks about some of the trade off and, and what inspired this particular process. There are more benefits um, than there are um, impacts to the corridor. So there's increase in safety for, for bicycle comfort and safety. Um, there's an uh, increase in economic benefit out of this. We did a, we had uh, our consultants do a study of similar projects across the country and in similar kinds of communities or, or locations or some that were not similar location, but a very similar kind of project. And what they found is in almost every instance, there was an increase in economic um, activity and, and business activity after the project was completed. The few that projects that show there was a negative impact were almost exclusively projects where they removed all of the on-street parking. So again, thoughtful as, as we were thinking about our design, knowing that on-street parking was a really important part of this and that we wanted to preserve that. All right, so that was Aaron Wilson um, um, talking a little bit more about this. And a big chunk of this would reduce traffic uh, uh, related incidents by 50%. And I think a lot of this motivation, um, you know, not, not actually don't, I don't think, but he also, Aaron Wilson mentioned in his presentation is that um, while the construction of the Bear Track Bridge was ongoing, they noticed that there wasn't much change in traffic. There's still the same amount of people. And, you know, people were going down the single lanes anyways. And, you know, uh, opposed from those peak hours, um, it, it really didn't make much of a difference in terms of it. And overall, this would create another buffer with the bike lanes to uh, make it a lot safer for pedestrians and bikers alike. And not to mention, you know, uptown and downtown, they want to make it a place for people to be able to walk safely and just kind of enjoy. And I think that's kind of what they want um, ha to happen in the downtown area. You know, slow down. This is not a throughway street for a lot of folks. This is a, just kind of like you're going downtown. So they want to treat it more like kind of going to like a uh, different neighborhood, except this neighborhood is more business related. So that's interesting how they're going to moving forward on this. And um, yeah, that's how I interpret it in terms of, you know, these meetings. And I've been talking about it a little bit on hand. You know, a lot of changes are happening. Um, I haven't talked too much about the, uh, uh, the new painted for uh, Front and Main Street, which is going to be uh, quite a, an extensive uh, change for the city of Missoula because, you know, they've been a pretty much one way as long as I remember. So 
Um, before I wrap, I wanted to mention that Wednesdays with the City, uh, Wednesdays with the Mayor will be available, is available on MCAT's YouTube and social media. Um, Jordan Hess, uh, the Mayor, spoke with uh, Dennis Bragg, the host of the show, who talked a lot about the uh, post office, but mostly about our broken tax system and how the uh, state of Montana has been pretty tight-fisted when it comes to a lot of the money, while local communities have been forced to uh, raise uh, property taxes just to c continue many of the services that we enjoy here in the city of Missoula. So um, Mayor Jordan Hess was quoted in saying that more, most communities, not just Missoula, property taxes make up more than 90% of every city's budget every year. So, and in, in the city of Missoula, I think he said somewhere about 94% of the general fund for the city of Missoula is just property taxes. So uh, for all meetings like this and, and for more information, go to ci.missoula.mt.org. US. Up next, we have a uh, guest in the studio, uh, a pre recorded interview with uh, Tell Us Something, Mark Moss, telling us something. Hey, Mark. We're hey, here Scott. with Mark Moss. He is the uh, executive director of Tell Us Something. That's right. And he's here to uh, ask and tell us some more about Tell Us Something. So, well, you have an event that's coming up and you're looking for some recruits. That's right. We have an event on March 30th at the Denison Theater, and we are looking for storytellers. The pitch deadline is February 20th and you can call the pitch line 406-203-4683 and you have three minutes to leave your pitch and we need to hear the beginning middle and end no cliffhangers on the theme of the first time so yeah and most of these stories are about 10 minutes long yep. and they're just fully formed stories nice anecdotes a lot of times and i've seen a lot of them and they're always really great great stories and you always have a good amount of people that do it for sure yeah we have eight storytellers they each have 10 minutes to share their story everyone is coached by me one-on-one -on -one, and then there is a group workshop as well so you're not going to get up on the stage without a lot of preparation and help and support from us and speaking of workshop when is your next workshop uh, well, the next workshop will be around the live event, and I think that's March uh, 18th or something like that. Okay. Yeah. So, and usually the group workshop is just everyone comes over to my house, and we have a little potluck dinner, and uh, we go through almost like a dry run. All right, cool. And yeah. how do these usually go? You're just like, oh, you can probably drop that part. You can add. Yeah, it's, you know, they tell their story all the way, and, um, and then we sort of deconstruct it together and say, this worked, this didn't work. And because that didn't work, you should try this instead, that sort of thing. And for me personally, like if I start telling a story, I start rambling. So it's yeah. like, it, it's too easy for us to really get into the story and the really the, uh, the real details of it all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's easy to go down a little rabbit trail sometimes. And mm -hmm. so I help them with tips and, on how to you know, stay focused and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And so the theme is first time. The first time. And depending upon what your first time means, could be anything. It could be anything. It could be the first time you broke your leg. It could be your first kiss. It could oh. be the first time you quit a job. It could be the first time you got a job. It could be however you want to interpret the first time. Yeah. That's what your story can be. And everyone has a first time story. Oh, yeah. The first time I wrote a hoverboard. This guy. Oh, wow. That was you remember us? that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was a long time ago. Uh, and it was in the old MCAT studio. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. So uh, tell us once again, when are the times when people can find more information about this uh, event? People and can more. find more information at tellussomething.org. And that's where you can also purchase tickets if you want and learn more about how to share your story. Again, the pitch line is 406-203-4683. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> so um, as we jump right back in, Makerspace is doing a walk-in from uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. if you want 3D printing or you want some basic uh, um, laser engraving and all sorts of fun uh, things here at the Makerspace at the Missoula Public Library here on the first floor. It is a great opportunity for folks to get involved with that. Um, yoga for health and 
Healthy Aging Yo uh, Red Willow Learning Center. This is one of the many things in the Missoula community has where they have different classes, different things. It's kind of a, a consortium of uh, education and also if people want to teach uh, Red Willow and the Learning Center, there's a lot of uh, uh, great opportunities for people to uh, teach and learn there as well. So it's like a kind of like an education co-op. Family fun time at Mismo Gymnastics, indoor fun. Family fun time at the YMCA, indoor fun as well, so for some families, so both starting at 10 a.m. Um, also around 10.30 a.m. Uh, this morning and Saturdays, every Friday, Saturday, they have Tiny Tales and Story Time here at the Missoula Public Library. Singing songs, plays, um, well not necessarily plays, but uh, they sing songs, read books, and have some art activities after the fact. Um, yarns and watercolor, uh, 12 noon every uh, Friday on the fourth floor. Uh, watercolor is a great way to uh, improve your uh, painting skills. Yarns is a great way for just to kind of have a community space just where you can stitch and crochet, just a, just a hangout place. If you don't want to do it at home, you can do it with other folks and just kind of uh, um, gossip and stuff. Uh, pop in and paint, painting with a twist, one of the many painting related events that take place here in Missoula. Painting with a twist has been kind of uh, uh, hit on hard in terms of just uh, uh, letting people know that they're there encourage people to come down and do some painting. Um, young Adults Writer Group, um, a library art box on the second floor. This is in, in any uh, aspiring writers or lit majors want to get involved with the Missoula Public Library and get some positive feedback. Uh, for History Buffs, the beginning of time with George uh, Seilstad. Um, so ongoing series on the fourth floor, after hours featuring radio waves from space were discovered unexpectedly in 1933 by Carl Jenkins at Bell Telephone Laboratories. The echo of creation is what it was and 13.8 billion years ago is when space time and the seeds of matter came into existence. This would go on to prove that the theory that our television slash radio signals are being sent to outer space upwards of 114 light years away. So it's, it's kind of an interesting because you can, if you're 114 light years away, you would hear the dawn of most radio in the United States and around the world as well. Um, Zoo Town Cabaret presents Queer Cabaret starting at 7 p.m. Queer Cabaret is at Zoo Town Arts Community Center. Um, so LGBTQ plus composers from a wide array of styles and periods featuring the talented students of Zoo Town Cabaret, UM's musical theater performances ensemble. So the house that Rob built, this is a University of Montana original documentary. Uh, do you remember Robin Selvig? You know, he's the Lady Grizz coach and he had a, uh, he led the Lady Grizz coach in many NCAA, um, um, uh, um, um, finals um, and plenty of uh, conference titles throughout his 40 plus year tenure at the University of Montana. And so he's going to be there along with some old players from back in his heyday uh, to kind of watch and discuss this uh, documentary that he's all about. So this is going to be at the University of Montana's Adams Center tonight at 7 p.m. It's definitely worth a try, especially if you're a Lady Grizz sports fan. Um, let's say Puffs. Um, MCT, it's a show about, it's a comedy about wizards who uh, just kind of want to avoid the whole uh, Harry Potter side of things, but we're just kind of like, just kind of keeping their head down and doing schoolwork. So that's the MCT um, a theater production happening tonight and this weekend with some matinees and the two in the afternoon. It's just, a, it's a nice play. It's nice art. Um, the Benevolence at Old Post is going to be a jam band at the Old Post starting at 8 p.m. tonight. Shakedown Country is going to be at Sunrise Saloon and Josh Farmer will be wrapping it up at the Union Club. Um, tonight as well. Saturday, you got markets and such. Orchard Homes is also doing their farmer's market over at Orchard Homes just off of 3rd, um, off of Reserve Street, a little bit down 3rd Street. Um, the Josh, uh, no, sorry. Um, then you have the uh, winter market, which is hosted at the mall, and they do that to supplement people who are missing the farmer's market during the summer. Um, during the winter season, I mean. Uh, wildlife tracks and signs. Um, so this is the Swan Valley Connections. Spend one day on the field trip uh, honing your eyes and subtle clues about our incredible wildlife and learn how to read their tracks, interpret signs to identify animals and to determine their movements and behaviors in the Swan Valley and beyond. It's $100 per person per class, includes snowshoes for those who need them. Spots are limited and you can register at swanvalleyconnections.org. A day trip through the uh, Chakras Yoga and Meditation at Westside Theater. Uh, kind of like the new Downtown Dance Collective, but a nice uh, large venue to stretch your legs. Uh, kids class Montana Bear Friend. 
Painting with a Twist is also doing one of those things, and you can register at paintingswithatwist.com. Missoula MCAT orientation is happening this Saturday, so every Saturday at 10 a.m. you can drop in or you can register on our website, MCAT.org, to be part of MCAT. And the orientation is all about just being like, this is what we're all about. But for the most part, if you want to be a part of MCAT, you got to be a producer. So what that necessarily means is that, hey, you watch television, you watch shows, like, hey, I can do that. It's like, it's not as simple as that, but MCAT staff are here as well to help you create your own voice in terms of producing media and stuff like that. So we don't necessarily always have to have it on our channel, but we also have to uh, help you guys create your own videos along the way. So this, it's a great opportunity for a lot of folks to come down here. And um, yeah, it's a, we kind of facilitate broadcast television in the library that facilitates books. Cool. All right, storytelling at Traveler's Rest State Park. Hal Stearns is going to be hosting this. This is an ongoing series that goes well until the end of February. This talk explores the legend and the known history of young a young woman who has to deal with the cultural, social, and political barriers, and without doubt while serving as one of the most vital members of the Lewis Clinton Clark expedition. I wonder who this is. Uh, Fix It Clinic, home resource. It's, it's kind of like MCAT, but more generated to kind of uh, getting your hands dirty and working towards home improvement and gardening. So great place to rent tools for short term use rather than buying that third hammer that you misplaced. Um, Fix It Clinic, bring your ripped or torn clothing, broken household appliance, wobbly furniture, and learn how to make them new again. Home Resource facilitates those Fix It Clinic so folks of all ages can learn how to fix and repair their beloved materials instead of sending them to the landfill. Um, up next, we also have Missoula Public Library is doing a making an artist book with Tracy Hall. Participants will then create a simple book form that they can decorate with provided supplies. And your know, art books are pretty essential if you're going to be a realistic artist and for those who like to do some sketching and stuff on the side. Um, yeah, it's a great opportunity and it's going to be at the Missoula Public Library on the fourth floor. MCAT also has our Saturday drop-ins from 1 to 3 every single Saturday. We're going to be our, doing our Saturday drop-ins and it's a great opportunity for kids to come in, just kind of create and we just kind of facilitate. We got some Legos, we've got some stick bots, we've got some army mins, we got some uh, uh, whiteboards so a lot of kids get an opportunity to actually draw and create using the power of stop animation. So you basically take a picture, you move something, you take a picture, you move something, boom, you got an animation. And you saw a couple of those teases earlier in my show. So, Missoula Symphony Orchestra, this is going to be a family concert at the University of Montana. The mo mountain that loved a bird is a beautiful story of friendship and renewal. This well-loved uh, story by American author Alice McLaren, set to play Pulitzer Prize winning composer Carolyn Shaw, highlights universal truth and, and it tells a lyrical tale of small birds that change the life of cold and barren mountains into sensitive poetic prose. So, Missoula Symphony Orchestra happening to have doing a family concert tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. Lunar New Year Parade, and so full, fun annual parade at, in Hot Springs, uh, break up the winter and ha add some fun and frivolity to a January day. Uh, RMEF, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Missoula's Ladies Night Out at University of Montana. Uh, ladies who care about wildlife and outdoors will have a fun night giving back to elk country. Games, raffles, auction, laughter, and a whole lot of fun. Bring your friends and reserve a whole table. This year's theme is Wild West. Sorry guys, this event is for ladies only. Um, Blue Shadow, uh, it's blues music. It is going to be featured at Imagination Brewing Company and starting at 6 p.m. Another, these are uh, another 6 p.m. The Ten Spoon Winery is doing some rock music. It is going to be featuring the Benevolence. Uh, Road Agents going to be at Jaffworks Brewing Company. And as we get later and in, later into the night, Westside Theater is going to feature R Lee Rizzo in concert uh, with folk music. Uh, Cranky's on Public House is going to have um, Tom Catmull. Um, if you kind of like the whole kind of Pearl Jammy type music, Tom Catmull is your guy. One of his kids was in our uh, summer camps. Still very close with them. Um, Night Blooming Jasmine at the Old Post and is going to be uh, featuring jazz. So, man, Old Post is becoming kind of like the jazz destination of Missoula so far. Jaden Decker is going to be at Benny's French Town Club. Um, yeah, so a solid snack karaoke at Westside Lanes. Um, we got Jackson Holt is going to be a Union Club jam.